You're tuned in to the only all sports talk network in the Middle East, IsraelSportsRadio.com. Check out the Israel Sports Radio store by clicking on the store tab on IsraelSportsRadio.com. Great items such as T-shirts, hats, books, and much, much more. Price does include shipping, and we do ship throughout the entire world. All major credit cards are accepted to make your shopping experience easy and convenient. So once again, click on the store tab on www.israelsportsradio.com. Broadcasting live from Israel. IsraelSportsRadio.com Folks, as you may or may not know, Israel Sports Radio is not supported by government funding or personal donations or solicitations. Rather, it is supported by people just like you by purchasing gifts at the Israel Sports Radio store. Your purchase of a t-shirt, a hat, or book helps us continue our great, fabulous programming, such as bringing the Maccabi Baseball 2013 or the Israel Football League in the last few years. We hope to continue broadcasting for you fine folks out there throughout the entire world who listen to the station. And the way we are able to do so is through purchases through our Israel Sports Radio store. So once again, click on the store tab on www.israelsportsradio.com. Broadcasting live from Jerusalem, IsraelSportsRadio.com. Check out the Israel Sports Radio store by clicking on the store tab on IsraelSportsRadio.com. Great items such as T-shirts, hats, books, and much, much more. Price does include shipping, and we do ship throughout the entire world. All major credit cards are accepted to make your shopping experience easy and convenient. So once again, click on the store tab on www.israelsportsradio.com. Building love of Israel, one sports fan at a time. Israelsportsradio.com. Folks, as you may or may not know, Israel Sports Radio is not supported by government funding or personal donations or solicitations. Rather, it is supported by people just like you by purchasing gifts at the Israel Sports Radio store. Your purchase of a t-shirt, a hat, or book helps us continue our great, fabulous programming, such as bringing the Maccabi Baseball 2013 or the Israel Football League in the last few years. We hope to continue broadcasting for you fine folks out there throughout the entire world who listen to the station. And the way we are able to do so is through purchases through our Israel Sports Radio store. So once again, click on the store tab on www.israelsportsradio.com. You're tuned in to the only all sports talk network in the Middle East, IsraelSportsRadio.com. Connecticut School of Broadcasting founder Dick Robinson. You know, the media business has changed a lot since we opened our doors in 1964. Now media content is everywhere, on air, online, on the go. More than ever, companies are looking for people to help drive this new media. At Connecticut School of Broadcasting, you'll get hands-on training on the latest software and equipment in a matter of months, not years. Connecticut School of Broadcasting has placed thousands of grads in broadcast media careers. It's all about versatility. You see, at a radio station, if you also know how to shoot, edit, and post videos, you become a pretty hot commodity. That's the training you get at Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Connecticut School of Broadcasting with locations up and down the East Coast from Massachusetts to Miami. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. Connecticut School of Broadcasting, the nation's oldest and largest group of broadcast media schools. Redefining training in radio, TV, and new media. Get trained. Get connected. 1-800-TV-RADIO. Live from Studio C at the Cherry Hill Campus for the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. It's all noise radios, sports talk. Bye. Down goes Frazier. He scores. High fly ball into right field. She is gone. 
Welcome to another edition of Sports Talk with the Sp- All Noise Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. We got a lot to get to, so stay right where you are. If you want to get in on the show, 856 330 or chime in on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash sports talk with the Sp- or you can tweet at me, send me a Twitter message. My handle is at the G. We got a lot on the plate here. Firstly, it's tonight is the is the start of the last game, the fourth preseason game, which to most people is really a waste of time. You know, a lot of people would rather watch Dancing with the Stars, America's Got Talent, or just go cut the grass or something as opposed to watching the fourth preseason game. But we're a lot of teams have to make their roster cuts from 75 players to 53 players. This is the game where the coaches make those final decisions. This is the game where the coaches are looking at these players as to who really gives me the reason to stay on this football team and who is not doing enough that, uh, to earn their roster spot. So it should be a very interesting. It's the fourth game of the preseason I always found to be very entertaining because you have a lot of guys who you probably will never see again, you probably will never hear of again, or may not have a career beyond just the practice squad if they even make the roster. And these guys are everyone who's playing in this game for an extended period of time is fighting for his roster, his his football life. So when you have a team, for example, like the New York Jets, they have a real it's a real big quarterback carousel. It's Mark Sanchez, Geno Smith, Greg McElroy, Sims, you have as well Matt Sims, and you also have the new incoming uh, Graham Harrell from Green Bay, who was released, who was cut last week after Vince Young took his backup position to Aaron Rodgers. All of the latter three, obviously, are fighting for the number three slot on this roster, which because Greg McElroy is likely not going to play in this game because he has a what, the, what hockey players like to call a lower le- or a leg injury, uh, the speculation is, of course, it's anywhere between his knee and his ankle. Likely leads me to believe that he's going to be released. And it's, this, is, this game is going to be between Matt Sims and Graham Harrell as to who the third quarterback on this roster is going to be. Who the emergency quarterback is, if you may. Additionally, you have other teams like the Philadelphia Eagles where in this game they know that Mike Vick is going to be the week one starter. And you also know that Nick Foles is your backup. But the question in Philly is, should we play, should the team play Nick Foles? Because Mike Vick, throughout his career, has always been one play away, one injury away from the backup having to see a significant amount of playing time on the football field. Only once in Vick's career did he actually play a full 16-game season. So the question everybody in Philly is asking today is, should Nick Foles play in this fourth preseason game, in a meaningless preseason game, to get a few more reps in? Are those few more reps in real live game action really that worthwhile to potentially put him in hazard's way and harm's way and cause for him to injure himself, and now you're looking at Matt Barkley as the guy who's going to be backing up Mike Vick. Well, obviously, injuries are a part of the game, as you can see throughout all the teams in the league and throughout all sports. Injuries are part of the game, and the question that the coaches, and in this case Chip Kelly, the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles, is really faced with is should he really increase the injury potentiality, the injury possibility, whereas he could control if Nick Foles plays or not. Obviously, we're not going to see Mike Vick beyond maybe four snaps, beyond maybe one series uh, in, in this game, if at all. And 
in in New York in terms of the Jets, it'll be interesting to see. Mark Sanchez is is not playing because of the injury to his shoulder, and Geno Smith may or may not play. That's all dependent upon the the you know how the coaches feel as well to leave if he does you know to how long to leave him into the game see how long he will stay there in order to get a few more reps whereas Nick Foles in Philadelphia he already has played a couple games he knows what the NFL speed is like does he really need those reps and he's going to be cold anyways once he comes into the game if he comes into the game uh whenever it is that Mike Vick eventually injures himself and is knocked out of a game. Nick Foles won't have time necessarily to prepare beyond what he usually prepares for. It's not like he's playing with the first team offense in practice during the week. It's not like he's playing with the first team offense during the game, starting the game with the first team offense. He's going to come in cold, so to speak, during a game when Mike Vick goes out with an injury. So if he plays this game, if he plays any snaps in the fourth preseason game, I really think that it's Chip Kelly just putting Foles in more harm's way, doing potentially more harm to both Foles as well as to his team as a whole than actually doing any good by getting Foles in a couple more snaps, a couple more reps with, uh, with, what, would, with what would end up being a, a really meaningless game here in the fourth uh, preseason game uh, right before the season opens up for them Monday night against Washington against RG3. So really the the questions all fall on to the coaching staff as to what they're going to do. But what would seem to be the best is to just leave things as is and let those who are fighting for roster spots let those players really get the bulk get the entire game. Heck why not? It, for some of them they mean never play in another professional game in their life. So why not? Give it all to them. 856-330-4749. Chime me in on Twitter at the YossiG or on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash sports talk with the sports rabbi. And we're getting a chime in here from Zach in Center City saying that Nick Foles should play a couple reps, a couple snaps before he actually, uh, rather, no, sorry, before the season begins. Well, look, I understand if they do. You know, it's kind of like the damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because of the risk versus reward to put Nick Foles into the game. I I disagree with you. I think that Foles should not play in this game at all because it really doesn't do him any positive. The negative, the potential for negative outweighs the immediate positive for Nick Foles. I understand it's a new system. I understand it's a new coach. But really, how more prepared will you be for coming in and replacing Mike Vick by taking another dozen snaps? How much more? I, I just It doesn't seem like a, a reasonable, like a responsible thing for the coaching staff to do to allow Nick Foles to actually play any part in this fourth preseason game against the Jets. It really does not... It it, it, it it would baffle me. To a small degree it would baffle me, but I would not I would I would I wouldn't it wouldn't shock me if they played him, but I would be um I would be surprised a little bit because seriously, at the end of the day, this doesn't do that much benefit for Foles. It does a lot more potential harm for the Eagles team going forward, knowing that Mike Vick is one wrong turn, run one wrong hit, one wrong play away from sitting out a significant amount of time this season. Now, for the Jets, we all know what happened last week with this uh, whole uh, quarterbacking conundrum against the Giants. And, of course, their coach, Rex Ryan, you know, everything that he's done since he's gotten to New York has been out there, to say the least. A, from his press conferences, pregame, postgame, the, the the interviews after practice, everything has been, you know, New York size, big Apple size, it's bigger, it's in your face, and whether you like it or not, it's coming for you. 
Then, of course, you throw in a couple off-field incidents, a tattoo here, a uh, uh, Chick-fil-A there, and you end up with a very uh, you know, larger-than-life coach beyond what you could possibly have imagined when, when he came to New York, once he actually showed up. Then you have a coach who brings you to two championship games, AFC title games, back-to-back -back seasons, and then the team just tanks. So, of course, the question is begged and has been begged for a couple of months. Why did they give Sanchez that extension? Why did they essentially hand him the job when he really proved nothing to date? So you draft Geno Smith, bring, bring this whole quarterback competition battle that you had and you're technically still having in the, in the offseason and in, in, in during the preseason and camp. And to date, there's been no official word as for who the week one starter against Tampa Bay, against Darrell Rivas, the former Jet, and his Tampa Bay Buccaneers as to who is going to be the starting quarterback. Sanchez, the incumbent quarterback who's injured with his shoulder injury, or the rookie Geno Smith, electrifying at times, dismal at others, brutal even from time to time as well. Last week was one of those times where, where, where Geno Smith did not play nearly as well as he can, as he's been billed to be able to play at such a level uh he played last week like uh you know almost as bad as as a third grader i mean somebody who's really inexperienced as like a division three quarterback you would never expect somebody who should have been taken in the first round according to some with obviously being geno smith's all of his antics and whatnot pushed him back to the second round but had the potentiality to go in the first round certainly didn't expect him to play the way he played against the giants three interceptions and then an inexplicable walking out of the back of the end zone, not knowing where the sideline marker is, not and giving the Giants a safety. Two points plus the possession of the football. Inexplicable. So what happens? In comes Mark Sanchez at the end of the four, towards the end of the fourth quarter. A meaningless game. You want to talk about meaningless games? The third preseason game is the most meaningless game for that quarterback who is not starting. The quarterback who starts the game, obviously, it's the most important game because traditionally it's the week one starter who gets the most reps in the third preseason game and then is not playing in a fourth preseason game because that's the pointless game. So for the quarterback who comes in after the starter quarterback, certainly the rest of the game is no, there's nothing for him to prove, especially if your name is Mark Sanchez and you're all but handed the starting job anyways. So obviously it's not on Mark Sanchez to tell his coach, no, I'm not going in. Any player who's told by his coach, you're going in now, you're going to play. Yes, sir. Yes, coach. I'm going. All right. No problem. You know, they're gone. Because that's what they do as professionals. You tell, jump, how high is the question? In this case, it, the, the conundrum, the whole wow, the what is he doing factor falls on Rex Ryan and his inexplicable motion to put Mark Sanchez into the game, into the end of the fourth quarter in a meaningless preseason game because, as Rex Ryan quoted in the post-game conference, he, uh, Mark gave us the best chance to win. To win what? To win what? A preseason game against the Giants? What? You get bragging rights if you win? Big deal. You have bragging rights until the season begins. Big freaking deal. You beat the Giants. Joy to the world. You just potentially lost your starting quarterback. Not that he was any good anyways, but I, I guess the best of the worst at this point in time. So the question that has been begged is, should Rex Ryan be fired before the season opener? Or should the Jets hierarchy allow Rex to coach the rest of the season essentially as a lame dog coach 856-330-4749 taking your phone calls after this commercial break you're listening to sports talk mm. noise radio powered by the connecticut school of broadcasting honey again you're sitting here sulking i hate my job and i don't know what to do to change it get off the couch and go check out the connecticut school of broadcasting the connecticut school of broadcasting what's that <laughs> 
The Connecticut School of Broadcasting offers a career and lifestyle change through a broadcasting experience you won't ever forget. Log on to GoCSB.com to find out how a career in broadcasting is for you and not just the people you see on TV or hear on the radio. CSB focuses on many aspects of real-world broadcasting and their knowledgeable instructors teach you through a hands-on approach so you're in the studio in no time. To find out how CSB can help you work in an industry you love, call 1-800-TV-RADIO or check us out online at GoCSB.com. Why work 50 weeks a year for a two-week vacation when you can enjoy your job every day? Don't just sit there. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. Thanks, Thanks, CSB. CSB. All noise radio. The noise. The noise. You can't ignore. Welcome back to here on All Noise Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Like I mentioned before the break, the phone lines are open. 856-330-4749, jump in. We have the question, of course, is should Rex Ryan be fired before the season opener against Tampa, or should the Jets allow him to sit as the lame duck coach? We're going to go to the phone lines right now. We have a caller. It looks like this is Yogi from Brooklyn. Yogi, how are you doing out there? Doing good. How are you? Very good. Very good. So what do you think? What should the Jets do? Keep Rex as the coach for the season, likely knowing that he doesn't have another extension and that this is going to be his final season, barring a surprise Super Bowl run, maybe? Or should they fire him before the Tampa game? I don't know if you'd want to get rid of him before the Tampa game. You kind of want to give him a shot to see if maybe there is some magic in the year. But uh, definitely hot seat is not even the question for him. I think he's obviously a lame duck coach. But I don't know if you want to, you know, jump out and get rid of him now, start pretty much start anew now and 100% mail in the season. Well, I don't know if you'd be mailing in the season with him or you'd be mailing in the season without him, but certainly if you had to judge from last week against the Giants, the way that he ran the football team, the way that he coached the football team, the decision-making was very questionable at best. And you have to really wonder, you know, the Jets and Rex Ryan seem to be going, or seem to be entering, rather, this season with two different mentalities. The Jets obviously going through a rebuilding process, and Rex Ryan really on a scorching hot seat and in a win-now situation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, but it's still, you look at, obviously, he's pretty much ruined any chance of his brother ever getting a head coaching gig with the way he's managed the team in the past couple of years. Um, he's always proven that great defensive coordinators don't necessarily make great head coaches. So, totally agree with you there. He's definitely not, uh, I think this is going to be his last go around as a head coach for a while. Um, again, though, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think just with him, the team at least has a shot defensively. The question is if they can get some things put together on offense. Remember, they were a top-10 defense last year. They were just 28th in offense, and Sanchez with 26 turnovers himself. Well, that, that of course, then goes on, on team management to try to get somebody who you're not going to give that huge extension to for no apparent reason other than being able to not turn the ball over during those back-to-back AFC title runs. Now, I, uh, that all aside in terms of Sanchez, but I know you're big on the backup quarterbacks with the New York Jets. I know we've we've spoken online. You know, you we've we've uh, traded some messages here and there. But what what's up with that? What what what, what are you talked? Why? Well, who cares about the backups think, on the Jets? Well, here's the thing. You look at a guy like Sanchez. Ever since he's come into the league, he's been a prima donna. No leadership showing. That he does, he's never vocal about anything. And again, that can work sometimes if you can back it up, like Eli Manning, who backed it up. Mark Eli Sanders Manning didn't back up anything for a couple it, years. Teams with great defense, and he showed not much offensively. So that's that's the first thing. A guy like Greg McElroy, as the backup, was very vocal when he saw things were wrong. When he saw the Santonio Holmes, Mark Sanchez fight, he was vocal about it. He showed some leadership. He showed. Some, some things that you want to see in a possible franchise quarterback. And then when he has seen the field, he's done pretty well. So it just it's so silly how they're wasting draft picks, in my mind, on potential when they potentially have somebody on their roster already. Well, you, you bring up McElroy, but the issue with McElroy is the guy can't play right now anyways. 
He's got. Well, that's you, right now. You, you know, they they term that the hockey term is a, a leg injury. You know, that very vague, masking any you know worry. Lower body. Out. Yeah, lower lower body, lower you know lower. I don't know, whatever. It's it's a leg injury of some sort, ankles to knee. Some we're not sure exactly what it is since nobody's saying anything. But in terms of McElroy playing. It, there's a reason why a player sometimes is a number three on the team and not even a backup. And it shows that even after he did perform decent last year coming in in relief of Sanchez, but the team obviously doesn't have enough belief in him to have left him veer and have Sanchez finish the season on the bench because they brought Sanchez back. Well, yeah, because they signed him to that ridiculous extension. Yeah, but if you can't play, you can't play. Simple as that. I mean, look at look at what happened, for example, with the Rangers, New York Rangers hockey team in this past postseason. Brad Richards, who has a big contract, they benched him and they kept him on the bench because he didn't perform. If you have a player on your team who's not performing, it is incumbent upon you to keep that player on the bench until he proves that he can actually do or contribute something towards the team. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's how, that, that goes without saying. Here you have a guy who has contributed, and from the get-go, even though they said it was an open competition, the Jets made it quite obvious that this was Geno Smith versus Mark Sanchez, with everyone else getting the nibble of, you know, quarterback three. Well, which, it, which in my mind, you're, you're not. You, it's not an open competition unless you really open it up. And well, it seems it seemed to me year, that not even get a shot is just it's, it's a letdown. It seemed to me that this is the open competition now has turned into game four between Matt Sims and Graham Harrell because McElroy, unfortunately, as it does happen at times to players in professional sports, they just get injured at the wrong time. If McElroy, if McElroy would be fine and would be able to play to what you claim to be his potential, then yeah, maybe. But right now that's a moot point of McElroy playing or McElroy getting the opportunity because he can't. He physically can't perform right now. So in that sense, maybe you should start looking at Matt Sims or Graham Harrell, who played in a West Coast offense or who was in a West Coast-style offense in Green Bay backing up Aaron Rodgers for three years. Maybe he's the guy really you should be looking at, not at Greg McElroy. Well, that's what you wonder now. What happens if Sims and uh, Harrell have great games, let's say? Where does that leave, say, even Geno Smith? Well, Geno Smith should not be playing at all this season. Period. Unless he's the last quarterback on the roster and everybody else has gone down to injury, then you put Geno Smith in simply because you have to finish off the season. But he should not be playing at all because he doesn't know, he doesn't understand the speed of the professional game. Period. End of paragraph. End of story. Uh, Yogi, thanks for the phone call. You're listening to Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi here on All Noise Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. You want to get in on the conversation, 856-330-4749. Send me a text. Send me a tweet. Uh, text me at Facebook, facebook.com forward slash sports talk with the sports rabbi, or tweet at me at the YussieG. Look, you know, call before Yogi in Brooklyn. It, it, you know, he brought up a good point with... The whole Greg McElroy, he says it's a mishandling of that situation, but I, you can't really say much to that the Jets should be playing McElroy because McElroy can't play at this point in time. So it's a really it's a moot point for him to be bringing McElroy up. You want to bring up another quarter? You want to say McElroy should have been handled differently in the past? Fine is one thing, but right now he can't play. They put him in the first game and he injured himself. That's what happens. It happens to players. That's why not all players have the careers that people think that they should have. Injuries happen. Look at Bo Jackson, one of the greatest players to ever play professional sports, and he only lasted four seasons because of injury. He could have been the best ever, but it happens. I'm not saying McElroy is on any level like Bo Jackson, but the potentiality, according to Yogi, is there. I don't know. I don't see it. I see more potential with this guy that they've just brought in, Graham Harrell, from Green Bay, I see him being more potential because he fits better into the system. He's been in a West Coast style system, something similar to what Marty Morningweg, uh, Marty Morningweg has with the Jets. So I see that as a potential. You want to bring up Harold saying he should be the one who should be starting week one because Sanchez has the injury and 
Geno Smith just shouldn't be playing right now in the NFL. All right, I buy that. I'm totally down with that. I hear you. I got what you're saying. Yeah, no problem. It's all good. But in terms of Greg McElroy, are you kidding me? Come on. The guy can't even play right now. Why don't you bother bringing him up? Dude, seriously. 856-330-4749. Chime in. Text me, tweet at me, uh, let me know what you're thinking. Uh, we got here, Nico in Bergen, in Bergen County, New Jersey, says that Rex Ryan should be fired uh, before the season and the Jets should trade for Colt McCoy, San Francisco's backup quarterback. Uh, Nico, look, you know, you, I, I get what you're saying, you know, with the whole trading for Colt McCoy thing, but you got a guy, if you're trading for another backup, you have plenty of backups on your team right now. That's where I'll pull in what Yogi was saying, where the caller was saying before, to bring in your backups and let them actually prove that they have the you know what you think that they have, not to bring in a, a you know what this will be your fourth backup in the off season. Nah, come on, come on, man, you can't do that. Don't bring in McCoy. Colt McCoy. It's gonna cost you a couple more draft picks. Don't do that. Why? Why bring in Colt McCoy? I, I may may I don't know. Whatever it is. Uh, we got in a div in Brooklyn says to bring back Tebow after the Patriots whittle their roster down to 53 and release him. Wouldn't that be something, huh? Jets bringing back Tim Tebow. Wow how they mishandled that situation. Wow. No. No. Don't, don't do that to Tim Tebow, please. Uh, I like the kid. Good guy. Seems like a very genuine fellow. Uh, don't... don't Tim, don't come back to the New York Jets. They tried killing your career once. Don't let them try doing that again, please, for your own sake. 856-330-4749. We're asking the question here. Rex Ryan, fire him before the season opener or let him stay and be the lame duck coach for the season. Uh, so we got, we got Yogi now back on here. Uh, Yogi saying... Uh, that we that the Jets do not have a viable replacement for Rex. At least with him around, they have a they have the defense to be good. I can't argue with that. Rex does bring the defense to the table. I don't know how much of a of a team. I mean, they would really be the number thirty two team. They really would be the worst team if Rex is gone. I mean, then you're really talking about rebuilding. And that's like legitimate rebuilding when your team is the worst in the league. They might not even win a game. If Rex is not the coach. Oh, I'm serious. They really may not win a game if Rex is not the coach of the New York Jets this season. Maybe you keep him around then for a game or two. Win one and then fire him? Maybe. That's a good that's an idea. Now Ruvain in New York says that only the Jets would fire a coach two years removed from back to back title games. Because of a preseason game where the team actually won. Ruvain, you are smoking some fantastic stuff, I must tell you. Or maybe the, some of that angel dust stuff is coming down from New England and, and, and you're, is getting into your head. The reason why the Jets are considering, why this question even comes up to consider Rex Ryan to be fired is because of his coaching tactics. Right now, you don't bring in your potential starter for the first game of the year, for week one against Tampa. You don't bring in Mark Sanchez in the end of a fourth quarter, third preseason meaningless game because he gives you the best chance to win. To win what? What are you winning? Bragging rights against the Giants? Give me a freaking break, man. You don't bring him in to do that, and then you see what happens. Of course he's going to get injured. He's playing behind a second, third line. Of course he's going to get injured. The Giants players, their defense, they're all trying to make the team, make a name for themselves. Of course they're going to zone in on Mark Sanchez. Of course they're going to want to hit him a little harder because they want to make a name for themselves with the coach. Come on, man. Andy in Maryland says, Week 10 and Rex is done. I'm surprised you're giving him that long. I'm surprised you're giving him that long. 856-330-4749. More of your phone calls when we come back. You're listening to Sports Talk with the Sports... <laughs> 
Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. It's been 48 years Connecticut School of Broadcasting has helped place thousands of people, just like you, in exciting careers in radio, television, and the new media. At Connecticut School of Broadcasting, our hands-on approach is different. It's designed to have you spend less time in the classroom and more time in the studios. From the first day, you'll work with state-of-the-art equipment. Learn by doing from our team of industry professionals who come from their studios to ours. The best part about it, you'll learn it all in a matter of months, not years. Connecticut School of Broadcasting has a network of 12 campuses from Massachusetts to Miami. Remember, it's never too late to love what you do. So do what I did. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO. Step into the fast-paced world of the broadcast media. Day and evening classes begin soon. Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Get trained and get connected now. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. Your computer is blowing up. blowing up to the sounds of all noise radio powered radio. by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Welcome back to Sports Talk. All Noise Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Like I mentioned before the break, you can chime in 856-330-4749 or send me a text, facebook.com forward slash sports talk with the sports rabbi or send me a tweet. Hit me up on Twitter. My handle is at the Yossi G. And, of course, the question is, should Rex Ryan be fired before the season opener or... Should the Jets allow him to be the lame duck coach? I mean, you, you've you heard what everybody has to say. It's time for you to weigh in on what your feelings are on this matter with the New York Jets. Also, should the Philadelphia Eagles, should the Eagles play Nick Foles at all in tonight's game? I don't believe they should, but of course, weigh in 856-330-4749 with your opinions, or you can send me a text at... Facebook.com forward slash sports talk with the sports rabbi or tweet at me. My handle is at the Yossi G and in other, you know, news around the league. Really, it's been uh, the questions this week has been all around the New England Patriots. Tim Tebow, of course, will he make the final roster? And of course, Aaron Hernandez. I'm trying to see who I can't stand anymore in terms of news media. A-Rod or Aaron Hernandez? But I think right now it's still A-Rod who I'd rather hear less of. But in terms of Aaron Hernandez, there is a Rolling Stone magazine article that was leaked out a little bit, you know, some uh, some portions of it, but it's hitting newsstands tomorrow, explaining in depth and detail that Aaron Hernandez used PCP, also known as Angel Dust, always carried a gun with him wherever he went because he feared for his life, and that Coach Bill Belichick told Aaron Hernandez when Aaron told him that he feared that he was going to be killed, Belichick told Hernandez to go seek out a safe house. So, of course, this begs to you to wonder what the heck kind of things have been going on in the New England locker room where, you know, or in Belichick's office where his players are coming to him to talk to him about all these sort of things, and what kind of response is that from a coach? Wouldn't you think that if you were a head coach and a player... One of your players came to you, especially a player who you gave this really, really big extension, big money, $40 million, five years. A player like that, of that magnitude, who comes to you, the coach, and says, I think somebody's out to kill me. I think I'm, I'm being hunted. Wouldn't you then go ahead and call NFL security, who are kind of like the CIA, FBI, all wrapped up in one? Wouldn't you go ahead and say, oh, no, don't worry about it. You know, we'll take care of that, son. And then call the league office of security and say, hey, we got ourselves an issue over here? What do you think that would be the proper or appropriate response? I know I certainly would be one of those. But while this Rolling Stones article says it's not, it certainly begs you to wonder and to and, and we're to believe that what is going on in Bill Belichick's head. Now, obviously, we're not going to ever probably find out what's really going on in the mad genius's skull, but it really does lead you to wonder what the heck is going on with the New England Patriots. 856-330-4749. If you want to chime in, jump in. There's an open line here right now. Or if you want to send me a text because you're too scared to call, by all means, facebook.com forward slash sports talk with a sports rabbi or send me a tweet at the Yossi G. We have a, a chat in here from Brian in New York City saying that, 
This whole Rolling Stone magazine article is a farce. It's bogus from start to finish because who are they? I wouldn't go so far. Look, obviously I haven't read the whole article yet and most people have not. And everybody's free to draw to their own conclusions. But that said, sometimes the best stories or the most in-depth interviews, articles, things like that, they come from people, individuals, reporters, investigative journalists who are not in the sport or who are not in the arena of what they're talking about as that being their everyday job. Sometimes a, a, a reporter from outside of the football circles is the one who brings that information to light about somebody within the football circles that nobody no reporter in the football world would be able to ever do because the player simply just doesn't trust or the folks who that person is interviewing simply just doesn't trust a member of the football media for a football story. Rolling Stones calls, I think it's a little bit different. I think the reactions are a little bit different. I think the interviews go a little differently than they would if somebody else called. So... I, to, to say that it's a whole farce because who is this guy who he's not in the football world, I, 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 wouldn't, I would hold up there for a moment. Not necessarily. 856-330-4749. Chime in at the CG or send me a message, facebook.com forward slash sports talk with the sports rabbi. Uh, in terms of this whole thing and what Aaron Hernandez has been going through, uh, you know, obviously the family of Odin Lloyd, who Aaron Hernandez is accused of, Murdering uh, in the first degree, he'll be arraigned in a, in a couple days. And uh, I believe it's September 6th, he's going to be arraigned for first degree murder charges, that being Aaron Hernandez. Just everything that's been surrounding this situation, it's it's really, you know, it's tough for anybody. It's tough for the, the individuals involved. It's tough for the fans to listen to this constantly. And really, you just have to let it develop and allow for it to answer itself. Kind of like, a, you know, sometimes wars kind of end themselves. They figure themselves out. So here also, it's a battle. The battle is for the truth of what went on, the truth of what happened, who pulled the trigger, that sort of thing. And the other news for the New England Patriots, though, is Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow never ceased to go away. Never ceases to amaze. He's always around, hovering. Broncos, New York Jets, possibly not having a career in the NFL, New England Patriots, and still possibly not having a career in the NFL. Well, Tebow survived the cuts to 75. And, you know, whenever you have an owner of a franchise in your corner, you know that you're in a pretty good situation. Except if your owner is Robert Kraft and your coach's name is Bill Belichick, then maybe there's some leeway there to think otherwise. Robert Kraft has gone on the record to say that he hopes Tim Tebow makes the final 53, makes the final roster cuts because he likes the kid, because he likes what he brings to the table. He likes his attitude. He likes his approach to every single day, every single play. He likes his approach to how he practices. Plain and simple, Robert Kraft, Mr. Kraft, likes Tim Tebow and hopes that he sticks around. Well, certainly for Tim Tebow fans, they all hope that he sticks around because they know that New England is a good place for him to learn how to be a true and proper quarterback. And one of the greatest football, one of the greatest college football quarterbacks of all time, cannot really make the cut in the NFL. Makes you wonder what type of a system. Obviously, you, the New England system right now is like your classic quarterback uh, pocket passer. Tim Tebow's not, but because he's not, because he's a very mobile, very agile, very tough, rugged football player, makes him still valuable to the Patriots for possibly other positions. Of course, there's the H-back, the fullback, uh, punt blocker. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways that Bill Belichick can find uses for Tim Tebow outside of just the quarterback. Obviously, that's what he wants to be. He wants to be an NFL quarterback. 
And I really hope that it works out for him, although I have my predisposition towards that, that if you're not a quarterback walking in to the NFL, you're not going to be a quarterback when you leave the NFL. But that's just me. That's just my personal opinion on the matter. But I really hope that for Tim Tebow, it works out there in New England because he really was hamstrung. He was screwed by the Jets when they brought him in. Just I mean, really, it was just to sell PSLs, personal seat licenses, and tickets. They had no interest of using him at quarterback ever, and you saw that last season when they when Rex Ryan benched Mark Sanchez and instead of bringing in Tim Tebow, who was the number two on the roster, uh, on the depth chart rather, they went to the number three guy in Greg McElroy. So if you don't even believe in your number two guy, you don't even believe in the guy who you brought in to be the backup, then what the heck was it for? Why did you bring him in in the first place? It, you look at the whole thing, and it was just a wondering why, you know, obviously also why Tim Tebow signed with the Jets. He, should have gone to the Jaguars, his hometown team. But nonetheless, that's all you know, water over the bridge type of thing. I really hope it works out for him because he can learn a lot from Josh McDaniels. He can learn a lot from Bill Belichick. And obviously, he can learn a lot from one of the best quarterbacks ever to play the game, Tom Brady. And Brady could also give him lessons on what it was like to you know, be drafted at 199 overall, be drafted in the sixth round, and you know, play behind Drew Bledsoe and then turn to what he's become. So I really hope it works out for Tebow in New England with the Patriots. You're listening to Sports Talk here on All Noise Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. I'll be right back, so don't change that dial. You know, our jobs occupy more than half our waking hours. Shouldn't we be doing something we love? Call Connecticut School of Broadcasting at 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. Since 1964, Connecticut School of Broadcasting, with a network of 12 campuses from Massachusetts to Miami, has helped place thousands of grads as DJs, sportscasters, entertainment reporters, behind the scenes in audio and video production, every aspect of the broadcast media. Connecticut School of Broadcasting has trained men and women of all ages and backgrounds in a matter of months, not years. Learn by doing from area radio and TV pros. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. Remember, it's never too late to love what you do. Day and evening classes begin soon. Get trained. Get connected now. All noise radio. The noise. The noise. You can't ignore. Welcome back to Sports Talk with... Here on All Noise Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. As always, you can chime in here, 856-330-4749, or send me a text, facebook.com forward slash sports talk with the sports rabbi, or you can send me a Twitter message, tweet at me. My handle is at the Yussi G. One of the things that you know we're, we're talking about as uh, you know, the week progressed, you know, you, you wanted to find out what the final, uh, you know, outcome would be with the whole Johnny Manziel, Texas A&M, NCAA, what's going to happen? You know, I, I, for, for all those who were living under a rock the last couple of months, Johnny Manziel is, you know, is being looked into by the NCAA for apparently violating uh, Rule 15-2-2, uh, which basically says a player cannot do any, you know, cannot sign autographs or anything as such and be given cash or any sort of payments uh, for his John, or her John Hancock. So, of course, Johnny Manziel, there's uh, all this different evidence against him that he did the autograph signings, but, of course, the actual taking of monetary payment or anything like that, it cannot or was not proven. There's no evidence to that. No one's talking about that. So, obviously, if you have a player, a primetime star, who signs, you know, thousands of little mini Texas A&M helmets or, you know, jerseys or things like that, obviously, you know, you can come to your own conclusion. You know what's go what is going to happen after that. He's going to get paid for doing this sign session for a memorabilia dealer or two. But the NCAA can't suspend somebody just because of speculation. They need hard evidence. So the evidence that he did the signing was there, but the evidence that he took money or some sort of benefit was not. So the NCAA 
told the Texas A&M University, the president, the athletic director, they said, look, you guys got a choice. We can either come to some conclusion, some agreement, some way of explaining that both uh, you know, you, the university, and us, the athletic, and you know, NCAA, will be satisfied with the outcome. Some sort of suspension, some sort of something for Johnny for doing what he did. Now, of course, we cannot prove that any, you know, exchange of gifts, so to speak, was given. But we have the proof that he signed these things and everybody and their grandmother can make that assessment as to why he was signing. It wasn't just out of the kindness and gladness of his heart to sit there for hours on end signing autographs. And, or you can do that. Or we, the NCAA, will stay here, will stay on your backs, will uh, keep digging, keep prying, and you, the university, will have this cloud of suspicion, this cloud just hanging over your head because we, the NCAA, will still be here throughout the season, possibly even into next year or the year after. And if we find something down the road, everything that happens from this point till whatever it is that we find is all forfeited. Kind of like what happened with the uh, University of Southern Carolina, you know, uh, Southern California, USC, with Reggie Bush where all that stuff was vacated, their championship and other awards and trophies. So they finally came to a conclusion, that being Texas A&M and the NCAA, that Johnny Manziel will not be suspended for six games, as a lot of people thought. He won't even be suspended for the first two games against Rice and Sam Houston State, that a lot of people thought as well, because the third game really against Alabama is the game that everybody's going to tune into. No. Johnny Manziel is going to be suspended for a half a game for the first half of the first game against Rice this Saturday. The reason being for, quote, inadvertent violations of the rule 15-2-2. Really? This is what, okay, I, I know the NCAA has, has made a lot of enemies and has done a lot of odd things over the years and given interesting rulings and really things that kind of make you scratch your head and wonder what the heck is going on there. But this has certainly got to top the list. Take the cake as to what the heck? Are you kidding me? I mean, what's a half of game? At least, at, least, at least it wasn't the second half of the Rice game because he wouldn't be playing that anyways after Texas A&M is going to go up on Rice by like 25 points in the first half. Because that really would be just like, that's just pointless. I mean, he's sitting anyways the second half. Uh, suspending him, suspending Johnny Manziel for the first half of the game against Rice is literally the lightest possible slap of a wrist that anybody can possibly give anyone. I mean, you're talking Johnny Football went to went from Johnny Football to Johnny Signatures and he's getting a half game suspension. I mean, this is it, it's Look, if you don't want to suspend the kid because you have no proof and also everybody in the world believes that this rule is the one of the most outrageous rules, bogus, silly, stupid edicts that you have in your handbook, rule book that is larger than God's Bible itself. If that is the reason why you're you're only giving him a half a game suspension, shame on you. Just 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 cut the rule out. Just forget the rule. Allow athletes through the court of public opinion where we the people decide that they are awesome and that they are worthy of our time of our signatures or uh, we want their signatures of our devotion and we will pay top dollar to see them play as a so to speak amateur if we the pu general public decide that a, a specific collegiate athlete is worth our while then why not why can't that athlete go ahead and sign th his name on a football jersey and get paid for it 
It's not like the university is paying them for it. It's not like it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something extra that another athlete, another player isn't getting. The only thing that's extra is because this athlete, this player, in this case, Johnny Manziel, is the player who we want to see, who we want to have his John Hancock, who we want to watch perform. Obviously, everybody else on the team goes you know, together as a unit, but we want Johnny Manziel, so we will pay $100, $200, $300, whatever it is, for a Johnny Manziel signed jersey. So if we're the ones who are deciding it, then why can't the players cash in on it? It's not like it's being, uh, you know, like I said, it's not like it's being something that the university is going to be doing. It's not like another athlete's going to have a complaint to the university and say, hey, what about him? How come him? What about me? Why can't I get what I want? That's not the case here. The case here is not the university saying, yeah, he's better than him. No, that's us. So if we are the ones who are saying, the fans are the ones who are saying that we want Johnny football, that we want Johnny Manziel, we want to do all these things, we want him to, we want him to do all these things, we want to watch him, we want to get all his autographs, etc., etc., then why not? Why not come to your senses, the NCAA? I mean, even the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, even they came to their senses and decided that their athletes are no longer called amateurs. Why don't you do the same? 856-330-4749. Chime in. Tune in. Uh, chime in. Send me a text at... Facebook.com forward slash sports talk with the sports rabbi or tweet at me. My handle is at the Yussi G. Allen Iverson is, uh, you know, is, is a really good player for most of his years in the NBA, playing about a decade with the Philadelphia 76ers. But the question that has risen up this week is Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame, the Basketball Hall of Fame, located in Springfield, Massachusetts, is Allen Iverson Hall of Fame worthy. You look at the guy's numbers, and it certainly seems it. Yeah, he may not have won a championship. He, he led. You look at what he did in that season where the 76ers played the Los Angeles Lakers for the title. Allen Iverson led a team single-handedly put that team on his shoulders, and rode them to the finals. This is a Lakers team that had not lost in the postseason, was in middle of a three-peat, and comes game one of the finals. I'm watching this. I see everybody in LA has got those brooms out, saying those sweep, sweep, sweep. And the 76ers beat the Lakers on their home court in that first game. I thought that was fantastic. Absolutely marvelous. But Allen Iverson as a player, I mean, he took guys who on most other teams would be the numbers 8, 9, 10, and 11 players. And those were his other starting four. Okay, maybe Dikembe Mutombo might have made the starting five because he's just a really tall guy. And as a center, fine. All right, so besides for Mutombo, you're talking about a team that large, large, and you know, by and large, was a team, of, you know, guys who would never make the starting lineup on any other squad that season in the NBA because they were not that good. They could play defense, so you bring them in for defensive situations if you were if they were on other teams, but they couldn't play offense. Are you kidding me? People complain about Iverson that he. You know, chucked the ball a lot. He was a ball hog. He, he, he took the ball and put up 30 shots a game. Obviously, who was the guy supposed to pass to? Nobody else could score on the team. Come on. All, all Mutombo does is block shots. He can't score. You know, other guys on the team couldn't score either. So, obvi so of course, it's going to be Allen Iverson always taking the shot or seemingly always taking the shots. Because who is the guy supposed to pass to who can be relied upon to score besides for him. Who else? There's a reason why he took 30 shots a game. 
There's nobody else on that team was in sniffing distance of 40% shooting uh, field goal shooting that season. Iverson for his career was a 42% shooter, and he was the best by far on that team. So you can just imagine what the numbers were in terms of field goal percentages for those players' careers were. 25 to 35% at best. So if you're going to tell me that, oh, Iverson shouldn't make it in because his field goal percentage isn't high enough because he took all those shots and missed so many, well, look at the tail of the tape. Are you going to tell me Kobe Bryant is not a Hall of Famer? Of course not. Kobe Bryant is a surefire first ballot Hall of Famer. His field goal percentage is 45% field goals made. Allen Iverson's field goal percentage is 42% field goals made. Are you going to tell me that Allen Iverson won't make the Hall of Fame because... He never won an NBA title. Well, uh, let's see. Karl Malone never won an NBA title. John Stockton never won an NBA title. Heck, Charles Barkley never won an NBA title. And all three of them are in the Hall of Fame. So you're going to tell me that's going to keep Allen Iverson out of the Hall of Fame? No. Allen Iverson's number is 26 points, 6-6. Six and six. Come on. Come on. That's, that's Hall of Fame numbers. I mean, there are guys in the Hall of Fame who have had worse numbers than that. So, that, I rest my case. Allen Iverson, first ballot Hall of Famer. Yeah, you may not have liked him. You may not have liked that afro or the cornrows. But think about this. This is a guy who challenged Shaquille O'Neal, the immovable object of the NBA. Challenged him in the paint. Allen Iverson is graciously listed at six foot, a buck sixty-five. I would put my bet that he's 5'10, 5'10 and a half, maybe a buck 50, a buck 55. Going up against 7'1, seven foot, seven foot 300 and change? Who are you kidding? I mean, this guy had a, a, an injury report list longer than most 70 year olds who go to the doctor. Everything from, from his nose to his elbows and wrist and broken fingers and knees, everything hurt him. But yet, he still went and challenged the guy of the NBA, the supreme center of his time in Shaquille O'Neal. If you're going to tell me that he shouldn't go in because you didn't like his antics, well, because he's selfish, since when does a player who's selfish not get into the Hall of Fame because of his selfishness? Kobe Bryant's pretty selfish. Michael Jordan is a real selfish guy. So, if you're going to tell me it's because of selfishness, then you're just a hater. Look, I'm not professing, I, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I, I'm all for Iverson love and whatnot, but it, this is the facts, Jack. This is the facts. And the facts show and point Allen Iverson in the direction of Springfield, Massachusetts on the first ballot. That's all for this show, this episode of Sports Talk with the Sports. <laughs> Next week it's the high holidays, Jewish high holidays, Rosh Hashanah. I will not be making, I will not be producing a show. And the week after will be a special edition show being brought to you straight and live, direct from Seoul in South Korea. You're listening to Sports Talk with the Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. All those radio. Powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. All Noise Radio is an internet radio station that's fully produced by graduates of the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. From modern rock to old school hip hop, country to classical, news, talk, sports, and more. It's the noise you can't ignore. Log on to allnoiseradio.com. Fire up the station. Find out more about your favorite jocks. Get the latest CSB news and more. Plus, you can take All Noise Radio with you on the go for free. Just download the Live 365 app to your iPhone, iPod Touch, or BlackBerry and search All Noise Radio. Check out tomorrow's broadcasters today at allnoiseradio.com. Powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Your computer is blowing up, blowing up to the sounds of All Noise Radio. Powered radio. by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting.